Good morning and welcome to our celebration of Easter Day and the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Uh, if you are home watching this on your computer, we invite you in spirit to come and be with he us here. A reminder that we will be having our drive-through communion on Easter Day between 11.30 and one o'clock. And we hope that we'll be able to greet you at that time and even give you an Easter lily as part of the celebration. Our liturgy begins in the prayer book. If you have a copy of your prayer book at home on page 123. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed, Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We do not love God or our neighbor fully or rightly, and so we pray, Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Because it is Easter, we will say together jubilantly uh, the Gloria in Excelsis. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. Let us pray. The Colic for Easter Day. O God, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to die upon the cross, and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the devil and the power of death, grant us grace to die daily to sin, that we may live with him in the joy of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. In his sermon to the household of Cornelius, Peter summarizes the life and ministry of Jesus and celebrates the new life offered in his name by the power of his death and resurrection. This is a reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, beginning in the 34th verse. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. 
and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. The portion of the Psalter appointed today is Psalm 118. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. The voice of joy and deliverance is in the dwelling of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord brings mighty things to pass. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord brings mighty things to pass. I shall not die, but live. And declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened and corrected me. But he has not given me over to death. Open unto me the gates of righteousness. That I may go into them and give thanks unto the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter into it. I will thank you, for you have heard me. And have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders refused has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. Glory Glory to to the the Father, Father, to the the Son, Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, beginning, is now, and will will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. In today's epistle, the Apostle Paul points the Colossian Christians to a new focus, which is a new life oriented on the risen and ascended Jesus. This is a reading from the epistle of St. Paul to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. St. Matthew declares the good news of the resurrection. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. He came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. The Gospel of our Lord according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Father, take my words and speak with them. Take our minds and think with them. And take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I would like this morning to persuade you 
to break one of the Ten Commandments. Now, I know that sounds like a funny thing to be listening to from a Christian pastor, but actually, I almost never obey this commandment, and I don't think you do either. In fact, I'm glad you don't. Now, in case you're running through the list, it is, drum roll, number four. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then comes the explanation. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath unto the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed it and hallowed it. Now, very few of you here I saw in church last Saturday. You came or you are coming on internet on Sunday, the first day of the week. And why is that? How do we explain this move from worshiping God on the seventh day to the first day of the week? We're talking here about changing the very law of God, one of the Ten Commandments, which God himself, so Moses tells us, wrote in stone I, with his, wrote the law with his, in stone with his own finger. And yet that change took place in the very first generation of the church. In the Acts of the Apostles, which takes us up to the year 62 AD, we read three times that those first Christians chose Sunday, the first day of the week, on which to worship their God and to celebrate the Eucharist. And they even gave that day a new name. They called it Kyriake, the Lord's Day. Now what I want to ask is this question. What happened? What happened that influenced those orthodox, God-fearing, Torah-believing, first century covenantal Jews to change the keeping of the Ten Commandments? I mean, if you woke up this morning and read in the paper that the Pope got married over the weekend, you'd be startled. Something happened, something monumental. She must be quite a gal. Or if you read that Vladimir Putin not only apologized to the Ukraine for invading the Crimea, but was being baptized this morning in the First Presbyterian Church, you'd be floored. Wow, something big is happening. Or if on your Twitter account, you read that Donald Trump was apologizing for so, saying so many mean and petty things and was resolving never to do such ever again, wow, you'd be floored. Something big is happening. When some great immovable object not only moves but jumps, you have to look for some great force. During the Second World War, the Nazis abandoned a critical uh, seaport in northern Africa on the Mediterranean Sea. But before they abandoned it, they took a number of barges, filled them with cement, went out and sunk them in the entrance to the port to render it ineffectual as a working seaport for the military. Now they assigned to the American Corps of Engineers the responsibility to restore this port in some fashion. But nobody knew how to do it. Nobody had the strength to go down and not only raise the weight, but now they had sunk into the muck of the, uh, uh, the, the bottom of the sea to raise them up. One fellow went out and he sat there for two days and he simply watched and he thought, and the tide would come in and the tide would go out, and then it came to him. They sent out a number of small vessels. They ran these three and four inch cables underneath one of these barges at low tide, and then they just waited for the tide itself, the power of the moon, to lift those barges up. And at each tide, they were able to remove one of those barges until the whole thing had been restored. It's that kind of power that we have to look for to explain this astonishing move from the bedrock of Jewish orthodoxy and obedience to Mosaic law to the unexpected worship on the first day of the week and obedience to something greater than Moses. And that something is the resurrected Jesus. And the significance of that new life, the promise of that kind of power ranked higher than creation itself. 
Those are the great themes of the Bible, creation and recreation. You see, the old creation was locked into a pattern of death. There were seven days to each week, and then it repeated. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, repeat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, repeat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But that pattern was a pattern which was, in the experience of the Jews, one of a political and economic and religious oppression. And then somewhere along the line, there emerged a body of literature called apocalyptic literature in about 150 uh, BC, and it ran through about 150 AD. And in this literature, they picked up the phrase, the day of the Lord, and they said, it's going to change. It's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that eighth day would be the day of the Lord, and old creation would be made new. Listen to this reading from the epistle of Barnabas. Now, this is not the biblical of Barnabas, although it's attributed to him, but this appeared around 110. Some people would even put it as early as 70. But here in chapter 15, verses 8 through 9, it reads, Finally, the Lord God said to them, Your new moons and your Sabbaths I cannot endure. He's quoting Isaiah here. You, and then he explains, you see what is God's meaning. It's not your present Sabbaths that are acceptable unto me, but the Sabbath which I have made, in the which, when I have set all things at rest, I will make a new beginning of the eighth day, which is the beginning of another world. And wherefore also we keep the eighth day for rejoicing in the which also Jesus rose from the dead. He's saying two things here. He's saying on the eighth day, Jesus rose from the dead. And he's saying, secondly, because of that, we celebrate on the eighth day, not the first day of the week, but we celebrate on the eighth day of the week. Now, this whole rhetorical conversation between Jews and Christians about the Lord's day and the eighth day quickly got dropped as a rhetorical device. But the Christians didn't drop it. I mean, they had simply won the debate. And so the other side simply dropped it and moved on. But Christians fell in love with that thought of the eighth day. And eight became a number of new life, of resurrection, of recreation. Think about how the number eight appears so frequently, you traditional Episcopalians and Anglicans. Remember that altars are eight-shaped. I mean, even in Baptist and Pentecostalist churches, the older churches would have eight sides to the pulpit. Or when I was a child growing up, we had a round chalice, but the base of the chalice was eight-sided. And here's one that everybody knows. Almost every baptismal font in the world is eight-sided. And that symbol of eight is drawing upon that tradition of new creation, new beginning, resurrection power. Church in which I grew up, St. James in Wichita, Kansas, had three steps up into the choir, two more steps up into the chancel, and then three steps up to the altar, eight steps being a sign. Oh, it's a symbol, it's a poetic sign, but to me, a powerful poetic sign. This seven-day pattern was locked in a gradual movement toward death, an irresistible vortex pulling things toward death, destruction, and dissolution. That principle of death is true about almost every realm of our existence. Think about it. Number one, the principle of death is true about our universe. They have discovered the second law of thermodynamics that says everything is running down. Even the ability of an atom to hold together the, the various things is itself running down and will not be able to hold together. H.G. Wells and Carl Sagan celebrated very much building rocket ships and going to other solar systems and other planets and other galleries and sending humanity out into the universe to survive. But even they recognized that that was just a temporary holding pattern in which they hoped to delay death, but they could not forestall death. The first principle was that 
of the universe. The second principle of death is true of our own bodies. I'm 68 years old. My eyes, my ears, my teeth, my knees, my muscles, my joints, my bones are all decaying. The ancient philosopher said that as soon as we are born, we began to die. I majored in classics at the university and the opening line of one ancient treatise goes like this. When we are born, we begin to die. And thirdly, the principle of death applies to our moral existence. We're born with hope and optimism, but so, so quickly that begins to disappear in the face of hard reality and there is moral and social death. You know, a lot of graduating classes will have a motto for, for the class. And way back in the mid 90s, my daughter's class took this as their class motto and it was published in the yearbook and it went like this, life's a bitch and then you die. Now that is such a jaded thought. And if I heard that from someone in their 50s or 60s or 70s, I might have some sympathy. But these are 18 and 17 year olds who are saying that. And that just makes me incredibly sad. But if you limit yourself to observing the closed system of seven days, omitting the eighth day, well, that motto is true. A drunk sits in a bar, drowning himself in booze, and the bartender says to him, why do you drink so much? The man replies, to forget my problem. The bartender asks, what's your problem? He says, I drink too much. Now, it's funny, and we could look at a whole host of bitter illustrations where a cycle of death rules relationships and behaviors. But the circularity in that joke has a kind of circularity of life. Depression leads to depression. Sorrow leads to sorrow. Jadedness leads to jadedness. We're stuck. We're trapped. We can't get out. Now, the first Christians recognize that the resurrection was something that happened not just to Jesus alone, but something that changed all of creation. The second law of thermodynamics might say that the universe is running down, but the first law of the resurrection says that God will make a new heaven and a new earth. The ancient philosophers might say that we begin to die as soon as we begin to live. But the living Lord says that we begin to live as soon as we begin to die. The psychiatrists and the behavioralists might say that we are trapped in a vicious cycle made by our own sins. But St. Paul, who had seen the resurrected Jesus, wrote to the Galatian Christians, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That promise belongs to every baptized, believing Christian. That promise is ours. Friends, we are the resurrected people. We are Easter people. We are new creation people. We are eighth day people. I love to listen to Christian testimonies, the autobiographies telling about God's influence in their life. And the basic shape of all those is between the BC, the before Christ part of the story, the AD after conversion part of their story. And I love to hear those. And those people come forth and they tell their stories and you love to see the power of Christ that has happened in their lives. The claims of death have been annulled. The principles of death have been nailed to the cross. They no longer apply. And are you living there? Are you living in the eighth day? Or are you still stuck, despite your Christian faith and belief, are you still stuck in that closed system of days one through seven with its despair? Many Christians do. There's a wonderful analogy from the world of biology that tells about this. They, they took a huge uh, aquarium of 20 gallons and they had two hemispheres and they sort of stuck them together with the fish inside. There were some holes for you know, getting 
the air in there and getting some food in there and such, but they clamped these together and then they lowered him into a larger aquarium about the size of this room. And then they simply let him live there for several months. And then somewhere along the line, they unclamped him and then very, very slowly, they pulled him apart. Not so fast to swish and drive him out, but just to pull it aside and then up and out of the way. You'll be fascinated to know that for several weeks, most of those fish continued to swim in that same 20 gallon space. What a symbol for Christians that we have been set free without boundaries in the eighth day, and yet we live as though we are still limited. The claims of death in our life have been annulled. The principles of death have been nailed to the cross. The boundaries have been removed. Easter people who walk with the living Christ are freed from death, not only in the final resurrection at the end of time, but freed from the bondage of death now with all of its habits, with all of its fears, with all of its fears. Sigmund Freud is accredited as being one of the most influential people in the 20th century. He wrote about sex as being the dominating motif that pushed so much in human life. He said everything is being driven by that. But people don't know in the last two years of his life, he shifted in that and said more fundamental than the reality of sex was the fear of death. And then even the motions of, 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 of sex had to do with operating out of that fear of death. We've been delivered from the fear of death. I can illustrate this with example after example. I'll limit myself to three. I think first of all of Hannah Moore. Uh, she was an actress in England at the end of the 18th century. Uh, she was considered by many people the most beautiful woman in England, sort of the Angelina Jolie of her time. But she was converted. And she began to use her influence and her talents for the sake of the kingdom of God. And she went back to Bristol and with her two sisters, she founded an orphanage. I visited this place just outside of the city of Bristol. And there she began to write these tracts for young women. Many of these were orphan people, but young women all across the board socially. John Wesley said that Hannah Moore may have been more influential in the change of England than either he or his brother Charles Wesley. She was a friend of Samuel Johnson. She knew John Newton. She knew William Wilberforce. She changed her era. Or I think of a teenage college girl who graduated from a university in Albania right after World War II. Her brother had been invited by King Zog. I'm not making this up. His name was really King Zog, Z-O-G. But he was ruling over a nation which was the first officially atheistic nation in the world. Not even Russia or China were officially atheistic, but Albania was. And her brother had been invited to have a high position in the government. He invited his sister, who was an honor student, to join him in serving King Zog. But she said to him, why should I sing King Zog when I can serve the King of Kings? And instead she went to serve a girl's school and to teach uh, in a Roman Catholic girl's school in India. Uh, it didn't go well for her. She didn't really find her net. She fell out of that. She started working with poor people while she was trying to decide what to do. And well, you know the story. She was Mother Teresa and she started a ministry that has wowed the world. Or I think third and lastly of my own dad, uh, on the eve of his 25th anniversary of his death, he died in a plane explosion on April 19th, 1995 in Coffeyville, Kansas. Uh, my dad was an utter agnostic, but he was converted at the age of 27, and he went from glory to glory. When he finally died, his funeral was the second largest funeral in the history of the church. It was filmed and shown in the basement of the church as well. And people still come up to me and say how influential your dad was in bringing me to faith or encouraging me 
in my faith. He's a man who lived his faith in his time. He was living in the eighth day. Friends, I'm declaring that the power that anointed these lives is available to you this morning. Eternal life begins now. Now, I know that some of you don't regularly come to church, but once a year. And I want you to know that I do not condemn any one of you. I don't judge you. I welcome you. I am glad you are here. But I wonder why you came. I wonder, like those angels asked the women at the tomb, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not found in a beautiful but unbelieved liturgy. He is not found in the dusty pages of a Bible that is not read. He is found even now walking up and down the aisles of this church or standing beside you as you watch this on your computer console, speaking and whispering peace and comfort and grace to his people. And if you let him touch you, he will then inject that newness of life into your life into your marriage, into your family, into your friendships, into your work, into any area of death in your life, and you can rise up today a new creation. Friends, if you believe it, say it with me. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. And with him, we are also risen to newness of life. Eighth day living. Praise God for his marvelous gift. And so let us stand and affirm our faith in the God of the eighth day, saying together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God and Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten and unmade, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for all ministers, for Foley, our Archbishop, and Frank, our Assisting Bishop, for Brad, Bubba, Deacon Chris, and this humble deacon, our parish clergy, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Your Hear Lord. our prayer. For the calling of our next rector, for our search committee, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, let us pray to the Lord. 
in the Anglican cycle of prayer. We pray for Holy Cross Anglican Church in Loganville, Georgia. Mm. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, at home or abroad, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially we pray for Donald, our president, Tate, our governor, our first responders, those in the armed forces, especially those in harm's way. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, let us pray to the Lord. We implore you in your mercy to stop the spread of this coronavirus, O Lord, and we ask for healing for all infected by this scourge, that by your blessing upon them and upon those who minister to them with your healing gifts, they may be restored to health of body and mind according to your gracious will, and may give thanks to you and your holy church. Almighty God, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, went about doing good and healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people, continue in our hospitals and research centers his gracious work among us, especially those ministering to people affected by the coronavirus. Console and heal the sick. Grant to the researchers, physicians, nurses, and assisting staff wisdom and skill diligence and patience. Prosper their work, O Lord, and send down your blessing upon all who serve of suffering through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those who departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may abide in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. To the end, all who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with, with your spirit. spirit. Peace. 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 This Holy Eucharist is offered to the greater glory of God with special intention of thanksgiving for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and for his invitation to us to enter into and live in the eighth day. The Lord be with you. And with, with your spirit. spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is, it is just and right. Thanks and praise. 
It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was offered for us and has taken away the sin of the world, who by his death has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As your great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our simple bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood and that we may evermore dwell in him, and, and he in us. us. Amen. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. 
have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you. Jimmy, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Brother, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out into the world to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you, and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.